try if it is decent or not. And if it is not decent or you don't like it, it we will uh, skip. Uh, okay? Sure. Please, Henny. Okay. How about uh, telling us what you are doing, what have you done in the past? And, and so we are here for you to, to listen to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for joining this. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to uh, present. Um, I just want to confirm again that you can see my screen. Sure, we can. We can. Yes. That's thank great. You. Okay. Um, again, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, um, I think I was chatting with Fabio many years ago. And um, so it's great to reconnect and um, and also to see uh, Tomac on uh, on on this uh, as well. Periodically, you'll see whoops, you'll see this um, this little mouse uh, going across the screen, but you also might see a little red laser uh, periodically. And I hope it's not too intrusive. Um, I have my email at the bottom in case anybody would like to contact me afterwards. Happy to discuss further. Uh, what uh, what we've been doing. So um, with that, I just want to again make sure you can see the screen and you can hear me. Sure, we can hear and we can uh, see what's going on on your screen. Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is um, I do the following and <clears throat> I think I might try to keep it to about a 30 minute talk if that's uh, if that's a any acceptable. any any time is good any time is good do whatever i think half an hour would be perfect but anything little bit less little bit more we have no okay. no here is a friday afternoon so <laughs> we should i hope i'm not keeping anybody from a, from their glass of wine in the uh, friday afternoon yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the all point. right so i'm gonna start first by giving you a little bit about the university of alberta and where i live because uh, that may be something that uh, is not well uh, known. We're not uh, Cambridge, we're not uh, <coughs> Italy or Venice, uh, you know, to be on the world stage, but we're close to the Rocky Mountains, Canadian Rockies. I'll uh, give you a little bit of uh, background about motivation for uh, obtaining thermophysical properties, but I know I'm speaking to the converted. I'll uh, contrast uh, what the general methods are that are that are in use. Then I'll describe the discharge crucible method, uh, both in terms of experimental as well as the uh, the model. I'll show you some sample results, and many of those are Tomax results. Uh, then I'll give you a little bit of update on the current status of our work on it, future work, and our acknowledgments. So to start with, here's a map of Canada. And there's the province of Alberta. Uh, there is the city of Edmonton uh, right here. Um, and you notice this little jagged line between Alberta and British Columbia. That's the boundary between the, uh, the, the um, what they call the, the, um, uh, the, the um, line separating when rivers uh, either uh, flow to the east or to the west. Uh, and it's just basically past the Rocky Mountains. So the Rocky Mountains in Canada are around here. This is where you might have heard of Banff and Jasper. Uh, they're basically located in this region here uh, of, uh, of Alberta. So we got, uh, we're one of the northernmost cities um, and in the world. And we receive a lot of sunshine, particularly in uh, in the summer. Uh, we have about a million or so population. Uh, thriving uh, area in terms of uh, uh, sports uh, and arts uh, all year round. And what you see here is our, uh, our green space, uh, which is uh, these pyramids are our uh, uh, planetarium in a, in a way for, for lots of uh, horticultural plants and exhibits uh, throughout the year. But we got a lot of green space uh, all along. We have the river Saskatchewan that uh, flows all the way to the Hudson's Bay. And that's the reason why Edmonton is located where it is because it was the, uh, the, the fort for the Hudson's Bay Company 
for uh, <coughs> transferring uh, fur trade uh, from uh, all, the all the furs that were captured as far down as California would come to the fort in Edmonton and then they would transport it in the summer to Hudson's Bay and then from Hudson's Bay they would go up all the way to the uh, to the UK. So that's a little background about Edmonton and about the University of Alberta. Uh, we're a very large university, we're one of the largest and the top five in Canada and we're kind of ranking the top 150 in the in the world. Um, you see engineering here in this portion of the campus. Uh, and uh, this is where I'm currently sitting, right in the 12th floor, uh, but facing uh, facing the, the, the south. So this is the north, this is south, and this is east and west. Um, we have about a half a billion dollars uh, average uh, annual income in terms of our uh, research uh, in the university. And um, we've got about 41,000 students that may likely grow in the near future. Uh, we've got about 18 faculties on uh, five campuses, uh, 800, three, almost 400 uh, undergraduate programs and 500 graduate programs. And there's about 2,000 faculty members and uh, about an extra 7,000 support staff. And we're 114 years old. Uh, so the campus goes all the way as far as you can see and even beyond where the picture goes. Uh, so this is just the, what we call the North Campus, the main campus of the of the university. And um, um, it's a it's a lovely area to um, to visit. And I think Tomac was here for a good uh, six months and uh, I think he enjoyed it. So let's get on with the topic of today. Um, I know I'm speaking to the converted, but uh, let's go through a little bit some of the areas not all, but some of the areas where thermophysical properties are important. Here I'm really focusing on uh, surface tension, density, and viscosity. Uh, of course, there's lots of others that need to be addressed and are important, but the technique we're going to talk about today addresses these three. So whenever you're doing brazing, soldering, or welding, of course, this is uh, uh, this is a key point when you're trying to put, for example, solder balls onto a onto a chip, uh, or when you're trying to cast uh, a strip casting, particularly that meniscus formation uh, is an absolutely critical part of the whole strip casting process. And being able to predict it and control it requires knowledge of uh, viscosity, density, and, and surface tension. Lots of spray processes, both in extractive metallurgy. This is sort of an Otokumpu flash smelter. Uh, this is a, a spray uh, deposition system, and this is a gas atomizing system. And all of these require very good knowledge of these three properties if we're able to control them and, um, and, and know how to operate these processes for different uh, materials. And of course, not uh, to go without, uh, every talk these days includes a reference to additive manufacturing. In a way, it's kind of a welding type process, but to make these really small features, one really needs to understand these thermophysical properties uh, of these metals and alloys. Of all the uh, methods that uh, are used for making these measurements, and I'm gonna just focus uh, as an example here on surface tension. There are really fundamental conditions that have to be, that are really met in order to make those measurements. One is the potential force in, induced by gravity. And here density, of course, is, is a relevant uh, property. And at the same time, we're looking at these potential forces as they act opposite surface tension forces. And there we're looking at either the shape of the liquid uh, or the shape of a bubble that is, uh, that is uh, pushed into a liquid bath. And essentially, it's a, the balance between these two is given often by the bond number, which is the potential force 
uh, relative to the surface tension force. And basically then you measure some experimental variable that enables you to calculate the surface tension. And all these methods involve and require us to know what the density of the material is. And so that one example of surface tension uh, leads us to say that we need more than one technique to be able to measure all these three properties. Here I'm going to talk about uh, two different uh, examples. One is the sessile drop technique that everybody's read about and knows about, and maybe even practices. Here we put a droplet onto a substrate and essentially over time measure the curvature, take pictures and then model the curvature of this droplet as a function of time. And, uh, and then basically try to calculate the surface tension from that uh, function. But you notice that density is, is one of the parameters. When you do the maximum bubble pressure technique, you basically pressurize a gas, form a bubble, and then watch and see what, what pressure that bubble is released uh, at some, and the, the bubble is released from a known height of immersion. And that surface tension again is measured uh, from this uh, maximum pressure calculation. But again, the density is here and needs to be known to be able to do this measurement. All of these techniques, these two included, uh, there are certainties in terms of what the shape of that bubble is, unless you use x-rays to look through the metal, uh, to look at it to see whether it is wetting the, uh, the orifice coming out of the tube or not, and here whether it is wetting the, uh, you know, the shape of the, of the droplet onto the, onto the substrate. Of course, the droplet starts off as a particle that has an oxide coating on it and one has to remove that oxide coating. So there are lots of complications. Typically, these are one measurement per experimental condition. Uh, so you, you go through a bunch of bubbles coming out and you get basically an average surface tension. And here one droplet will lead to one measurement condition. Wetting is an issue. Well, we'll talk about wetting with regard to discharge crucible uh, towards the end. And uh, they don't reflect really dynamic conditions in that the fluid is uh, largely stationary. Um, and then if you want the viscosity, you have to do a separate experiment to do it. And as I've said, density must be predetermined. There is one technique that allows you to do all three uh, values all three measurements in one in one uh, experiment <clears throat> and that is the electromagnetic levitation system uh, where you have basically uh, two induction coils uh, that one is basically to heat the sample and one is to levitate a six millimeter droplet that you see here uh, you have a high-speed camera a pyrometer and a cooling gas that's uh, running over the uh, the sample uh, you can do a lot of gases. It's non-contact. Uh, it's containerless, uh, so it really keeps the sample nice and uh, clean. Uh, on the Earth, you can do these measurements by getting the surface tension and the density. But in order to get the viscosity, you've got to go into space. You've got to go into micro microgravity conditions. And there is an EML system on this International Space Station. So you can imagine if you want to do all three measurements of a single sample, it's a very expensive uh, process uh, and both in terms of cost and time. So <clears throat> the, let's look at the discharge crucible method and what the principles of the technique really are. Imagine you've got a, a crucible or a container of uh, some dimension and you put a small orifice or a small hole in the bottom of that crucible uh, and you allow the fluid to flow. Uh, to be able to follow the flow or to predict the flow of that fluid, uh, we're familiar with the Bernoulli equation where we uh, balance things against the pressure difference on the, both sides 
the change in height, the change in the velocity at the interface here and at the exit of the orifice, and that equals any change in velocity with respect to time. If you choose the right set of conditions, uh, this term here ends up being uh, relatively constant. There isn't really a change in velocity with time. Um, if you do this uh, with the at in atmospheric conditions, both on top and below, this term will also disappear. And so you're basically left with these two terms, usually, uh, under non-inviscid condi non, uh, conditions. So you basically can get the, uh, with, with no viscous losses, get the velocity as a function of, of position. Usually this orifice is very small compared to this one. Uh, and this is basically this uh, equation comes from a differential balance on a differential element of a stream just about to exit the orifice. Important assumption in this derivation is that the stream diameter coming out here is exactly the same as the orifice diameter. So we are not assuming any wetting taking place uh, between the fluid exiting and the orifice of the bottom of the crucible. Okay, so way back when, back in uh, the year 2000 or so, when, when we started doing this work, we were actually doing some uh, consulting work for Alcoa trying to do some granulation, and we were having trouble getting the flow rate uh, from the flow from the crucible, because we need to know what the flow rate is to know what the right frequency is to form monodispersed mono size granules. Uh, and we weren't getting uh, agreement at all with, the, with our measured uh, flow rates and, and our predicted flow rates. So we decided to do a few little quick experiments using water here at different temperatures and ethylene using the Bernoulli equation and basically trying to see what the discharge, what the friction losses were. Now, ordinarily, all of these curves should fit on one curve because we're lo lo looking at using the same type of system, uh, same geometry, same orifice. There was no wetting taking place. And so the, the friction losses should be the same. But as you see here, we didn't get uh, agreement between these different experiments. So we decided to look at the different forces that were at play. And here's the potential force that you can see that was acting for a good part of uh, the portion of all the forces. Here you see the kinetic force. This is the in inertial force of the fluid exiting. But then here's the surface force that we see below here. And we see it particularly at the low heads. The surface force was quite significant. So we realized that we were missing a term in the Bernoulli equation. <clears throat> and so just for interest's sake, I'm not going to go through all the details, but we basically went ahead and incorporated uh, the term of the surface energy into the Bernoulli equation. And here you see the uh, accounting for uh, friction losses, which is a function of flow rate, density, and viscosity. And so you get this equation that says that the flow rate exiting of the fluid exiting the orifice is a function of the uh, friction losses, the size of the orifice, the height, the surface tension, and the density. And uh, when we basically took the data from the previous experiment and replotted it, knowing incorporating this equation, uh, we basically got all the discharge crucible, all the discharge coefficients falling onto the same curve. So we knew that we had accounted for this was the missing term that we had dealt with, uh, that we were missing before. But it dawned on us also that we can take this equation and turn it around and solve, for example, for surface tension, density, and viscosity here, because of the fact that as you're draining the crucible, if you measure the change in height with time, and if you measure the flow rate 
exiting the, the orifice as a function of time. Then you have, in a simple experiment, even if you've got uh, 100 milliliters of a fluid in the crucible, you've got over 100 data points. And so these three parameters of viscosity, surface tension, and density are three unknowns for an unknown for material with unknown properties. And you've got 100 data points to try to uh, fit and find the best values of these three properties that are agreeing with, um, with the flow conditions that are in the uh, obtained in the experiment. If you put this equation in dimensionless form, what you get here is the Froude number plus one over the bond number is equal to one. So again, we're getting potential forces, we're getting inertial forces, and we're getting the gravity forces at play here. So it follows the fundamentals of what we expect to see for a method that's trying to measure these, uh, these properties. Um, then um, actually I, I'm going to uh, digress a little bit. So then we did uh, try to do measurements on aluminum and uh, magnesium alloys, uh, which I'll show you a bit later, but that was a bit uh, uh, foolish of us. But whenever you start something new, you're always doing something foolish. Um, and then uh, the work, uh, the student that was working on this uh, uh, successfully got his master's, moved on, years went by, and then Professor Moser one day came visiting me in my office and said, would you like to try this on tin? And I said, I'd love to. I wish I could find the funds and the, and the opportunity to be able to uh, push this method a bit further and try it on, uh, on uh, lower mounting point metals so that we can really test it because aluminum is very reactive as everybody really knows. And uh, and so from there, and by the way, the reason Professor Moser was in Edmonton um, is because his daughter lived around the corner from my house. So small world. Uh, so make a long story short, after a couple of visits to Poland, and to the um, Institute, I met Tomac at those days, and then Tomac came over and, um, and did some experiments in our lab, and then also did some experiments back in, uh, in Krakow. And these are some of his results. So basically what you do is you do an experiment where you collect weight as a function of time, and this is for tin, and this is the size of the orifice that was done and the temperature. Of course, this was done in argon atmosphere. And this is done with different temperatures to make sure that we can get a good uh, calibration of the uh, discharge coefficient as a function of Reynolds number. And on there, we were also checking it with water at two different temperatures. Uh, and from there, uh, we plot the surface tension as a function of uh, temperature, uh, as I've indicated to you before. And these are uh, the brown, date, brown circles are the results of Tomac's work uh, compared with other people's uh, results that were done using different techniques. And over on the right, uh, you can see now with tin silver alloys, again, this is Tomac's work, uh, where he compares it with other uh, other published work using uh, other techniques, and the agreement is, is quite good. This is for surface tension. For viscosity, I'm showing here the tin silver uh, for different compositions. The work we've done was, uh, this is the work that Tomac again did with the DC method, are the diamonds, red diamonds that are here, and then the other method are using a modified capillary for viscosity measurements. You can see here we've got the 34.6 tin silver. Here's the 3.8 curve, and this is the pure tin curve. Uh, and so the 34.6 the curve sort of saddles between 55 silver and 32 silver measured by the modified capillary method. So we're getting good agreement with uh, classical methods. And of course, these classical methods 
have to measure again each of these properties separately. Well, uh, this data came, uh, viscosity came along with the surface tension and the density. Here is some more of Tomac's work showing the measurement of antimony. Uh, his work is shown here, the stars, the red stars, uh, in very good agreement with other work that was done using other techniques. Here's a, on the right, a tin uh, antimony alloy. Uh, again, showing here the black points are the different alloy compositions agreeing quite well with the other alloying compositions and measurements that were done. And this is just showing the surface tension that were done uh, using other techniques that are published uh, in the literature. Um, so this we're showing here in this case surface tension, but at the same time we also got viscosity and, and density. The one thing I'm not going to talk about is how this data fits with theoretical models of these properties, but uh, that's another topic maybe for another uh, for another talk. I wanted to kind of focus on the experiment and the methodology of getting data and how it compares with other measurements. So this is the viscosity for the tin uh, antimony uh, shown here in the black data points compared with uh, those measured again by other workers. Uh, showing very good agreement with other workers' uh, results using other techniques. So we're pretty happy and pretty confident. Um, this is now the original, some of the original work that was done uh, at the, in the early days by Stephen Roach. Uh, here is number three is our data for the surface tension of uh, aluminum, and this is under oxygen saturated conditions. Uh, here is the 2% variation. And this analysis was done by uh, Professor Mills, Ken Mills. Uh, fortunately, he has passed away, but he had done this thorough review of the surface tension properties of uh, pure metals. Uh, it's an excellent publication. I, I recommend you to uh, dig it out and, and have a good read of it. But he, uh, uh, found that our technique was uh, quite accurate uh, in terms of getting the the uh, properties of the uh, of the material. So we we're uh, bolstered and felt more confidence uh, with the technique from uh, after reading his uh, his analysis of our, of our work. Uh, here is the surface tension of AZ91D. It's a very common magnesium alloy. And we did this uh, measurement. It was a difficult set of experiments that were done under argon and SF6. SF6 is a very common gas used for protecting magnesium during commercial processing. Uh, it's being replaced because it's environmentally poor. Uh, it's, a, it's a really horrible gas for, uh, uh, for climate change and for uh, uh, CO2 impact uh, on the atmosphere. Uh, so, but here's the surface tension as a function of temperature. And this is with argon up at the top here. And we see that the presence of SF6 reduces that surface tension of, of the magnesium alloy. And it does so by basically forming a protective layer on its surface. And that's one of the mechanisms that lead to its uh, reduction in its surface tension. So that tells us the technique is able to not just get the properties, but get the properties as a function of the atmosphere that the material is in. However, one I mentioned before that one has to be careful about wetting. So this is more recent work done by uh, uh, Pat Flood, uh, who has uh, just finished his uh, his master's thesis uh, about a year ago. Um, and so here we're looking at uh, aluminum, uh, results of aluminum, and looking at the volumetric flow rate of, uh, of aluminum as a function of Reynolds number. Now, these are experimental results, the blue line shown here. But if you look in the literature and use the literature values for surface tension, viscosity, and density, 
this is the flow rate that one should be getting. And the reason for the difference between the two is that these experiments were done using alumina crucibles. And aluminum, liquid aluminum metal, very nicely wets alumina ceramic. And so we're seeing a reduction in the flow rate as a result of the wetting. Here on the right, we see the same uh, results. This is the, the experimental, uh, the, sorry, the experimental measurement is below here in blue. The predicted measurement is in green, and this is for an aluminum copper alloy. Again, with an experiment done using alumina as a crucible, all the previous work, uh, the previous work that was done on aluminum was done using graphite. Uh, and so here we see that the choice of material you use and uh, if it results in wetting can dramatically affect <clears throat> the results that you get. And it will affect the parameters that you get at the end in terms of density. But it turned out that the, the viscosity and the surface tension were still quite acceptable. Here we see the evidence of what we believe to be the evidence for the uh, wetting of the, of the orifice. These are three experiments of aluminum in the alumina crucibles. Here we're looking at flow rate from the literature using literature values for the properties divided by the measured value of the flow rate as a function of time. And you can see in all these three temperature cases, we are less than one as a ratio, indicating that we are uh, observing a flow rate that is slower than uh, should be the case if we did not have wetting at the crucible um, at the orifice uh, exit. On the right here, we see the capillary number. And the capillary number looks at our viscous forces relative to our surface tension forces. And if we have no wetting, this should be constant. But as you can see, we're plotting time here of the experiment. We're starting over here and ending up over here. So we're starting with a high capillary number, ending up with a much lower capillary number. And the capillary number is changing as the experiment is carried on. And so that's a clear indication of wetting. Okay. So that's, and, and the wetting basically results in the fact that the density does not agree with, you one doesn't get good values for density, but the surface tension and the viscosity still provides a good work. So where are we now? So when we saw that, we said, well, we need to upgrade the way we're doing the experiment. And so we built uh, this new device where we have basically, uh, sorry, I'm competing with, with this uh, laser pointer that's uh, going through here. Uh, so we basically have two, two sections here. One is the furnace section where we have an induction furnace, the crucible sits in it. We'll have a we have a thermocouple inside and we're gonna have a laser looking from the top down into the melt and this laser will give us a direct measure of the height of the liquid in the crucible as it flows out. Because up to this point, we've been getting the height by calibrating the crucible ahead of time and back calculating after we get the weight of material that goes on the load cell, we back calculate where the height was in the crucible. But this time we're gonna be having a laser giving us a direct measure of the height of the liquid in the crucible. And then we also collect the <coughs> load cell that gives us the weight of material as a function of time. Sorry, uh, as a function of time that is landing on the crucible. Uh, this will be an improvement because by having the height, uh, when you start with this experiment with a known weight of material in your crucible, once it's molten and it's at a known temperature with the laser, you measure its height, bang right there. We know the density at that temperature. And so therefore that becomes an input into the model. 
and then the load cell information afterwards gets used to be able to calculate the surface tension and the uh, viscosity. So again, we're still using the same device and getting three properties. One additional improvement, we're putting in here a, a uh, uh, oxygen getter uh, where we put some titanium chips over a heater uh, to be able to control and reduce the oxygen content uh, to a prescribed known level. So this unit is shown here on the left. Uh, this is the top is removed with the induction coil and the water cooling and the induction cables coming, power coming in. Uh, here you see the spot where the uh, laser unit would, would be sitting. And this is a pyrometer that's sitting over to the right, a viewing port, and then an extra port in case uh, one is needed. Um, and then the load cell sits near the bottom. Uh, the whole thing sits at about a meter, meter and a half in height, and about uh, 0.2 meters in diameter. So it's uh, a lot easier to control the atmosphere than the unit that Tomac was using many years ago. So we're uh, in the process of commissioning this, this unit. One of the current uh, things that we're also looking at is to look more closely at the orifice and at the orifice geometry. The orifice geometry plays an important role in the, in the function of this uh, technique. And so we've been looking at breaking down the parameters of designing the orifice, that is the, the chamfer that's here, the height of that chamfer, the width of that chamfer, the angle of that chamfer, as well as the diameter. And you can see here, we can express the viscous losses as a function of those parameters. Uh, and we can basically control those parameters through machining to be within certain ranges. Uh, we put in a set of parameters. We've been doing experiments with uh, water, for example. Uh, and we can see here that uh, the, we're looking at experiments versus a model. Uh, that uses those parameters. We see at the top left here three different designs of orifices, same angle, but different depths. And the, the length of the orifice here is different. Uh, this is a measured discharge crucible, uh, sorry, measured discharge coefficient as a function of Reynolds number for the three different geometries. And you can see there are some small differences uh, in the in the friction factor and the discharge coefficient, which you would expect because the geometry is different. And those differences, even though they appear small here, they could affect the prediction of properties uh, to some degree. And so we've put in the parameters in, of these orifices into the model, as I showed in the previous slide, and compared the prediction of the discharge coefficient as a function of these measured values, which you see here. And uh, this is for water. And we got uh, really good agreement uh, between those cases. And so we're currently looking at what is the optimum design of orifice that one should have in order to, as you'll see in a minute, maximize the effective forces that are taking place as the crucible is emptying. So here's a case where we're doing, this is a, a model case, looking at two different cases where we're um, designing on in, a, in the model a crucible of this geometry versus another crucible of this geometry with running with aluminum um, aluminum alloy at a, at a mounting point. And here you see when we run the model uh, for those two, uh, the crucible designs. Here's the total, this is the balance of forces or the energy distribution for crucible one and the energy distribution for crucible two. This is the total that we see, the red line in both cases. The Froud number starts off being quite high and ends up being low. The bond number starts off low and ends up high. And the viscous losses are relatively small with this kind of a design. 
On the other hand, with this other design here, you see the, 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 the fraud number starts off much lower. The surface, the bond number is higher than it was in Crucible 1 and ends up to be, uh, uh, starts off actually quite high, but ends up 40% of the energy is still is in the surface tension uh, or the surface forces, the bond number. And here you see the viscous forces, they start off low, but they go up and they're almost 50% or a little over 40%. So by changing the orifice design, one can improve the sensitivity of the method towards being able to get, sorry, being able to get the right, um, the right balance of forces and the right values of best, more accurate values of surface tension, density, and viscosity. So currently, we're looking at developing a model for looking at the accounting for wetting. Hopefully, we can get a contact angle in addition to uh, what we've been getting so far. And we're looking at optimizing uh, the, the orifice design. So what our future work, as I said, we're looking at uh, optimizing a nozzle design and optimum data analysis to reduce uh, error. Um, we still need to, to determine the minimum, minimize the uncertainty of the parameters. Uh, we need to, by choosing, choosing the optimal design of orifice, we're basically uh, optimizing the, the uh, or minimizing the error uh, in getting the different uh, property, three property values, density, viscosity, and surface tension. We're also extending the model to account for wetting phenomena to get uh, dynamic contact angle uh, in addition. And we're planning high temperature experiments uh, to look at aluminum, aluminum alloys, and steels. Of course, we're going to start with tin and, uh, and some low melting point materials. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our funders. Uh, NSERC is our national uh, funding agency, pardon me. Um, ESA, because we're collaborating with our uh, thermal prop colleagues in, uh, in DLR and in uh, other places in Europe to do experiments on the EML, comparing it with the measurements with the DC unit. Uh, Equispheres is a company in uh, Canada that does atomization. And DLR is our partners in uh, Thermoprop uh, for doing the experiments in, on the ISS with the EML that we compare that we will be comparing with the DC method. I want to uh, also acknowledge uh, uh, Jean-Sébastien Croll at IGL Nancy. Our current student, uh, Quentin Champ-Doiseau, Champ is doing a joint PhD between us and Université de Lorraine in France. Uh, I want to acknowledge Tomac, who's been really a champion of uh, pushing and getting a lot of data published on the DC method. He's been doing fantastically well. I think he's now a full prof at, uh, at, uh, in Krakow. I, I'm looking forward to hearing more about how he's uh, progressed. And of course, our group members, Steve Roach was the originator and the co-inventor of this technique. Uh, Aziz Bonio was a research associate uh, and uh, started off as a postdoc and research associate. He's since left since last March and joined industry. Quentin is currently a PhD student. Pat Flood is a master's student that finished about a year ago. So with that, that's the presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you for your presentation. I'm very, very clear and very, very nice. I think uh, I know something about your method, maybe not all. I'm not, I've not. i never been working seriously about that. I have a couple of questions, but maybe there are observations from the listeners. So we are from different parts of the world, actually, from uh, Italy, I see, then from uh, Argentina and from Mexico and so on. So it's nice uh, to have some people uh, all around Indeed, the world. Yes. And of course, from Poland, as Thomas is. And uh, so, uh, guys, do you have any, and Francesco De Logo, a good friend and colleague from the University of uh, Cagliari in Sardinia. Uh, any special question or don't, 
don't let me make the, the first question, but I would prefer you to do it. Uh, but OK, I have a very um, simple uh, question in the way. You know that there are some technologies as for uh, casting that are related to semi-solid processing. So yes. you can you can go uh, uh, real casting, for instance. And yes. there is a colleague that I will send you this presentation from Brazil, uh, which is Eugenio Zucchi and that I don't see here, but he will have some problems maybe in the communication, that he would like to, to extend his work in basically in tixoforming, so in very high fraction of, uh, of uh, solids, of solids. Uh, in the liquid, yeah. but is interested in rayo casting, so very low fraction of solids. So how about, you know, the, the possible behavior, you know, in would say a little bit of more high viscosity, like going up with the viscosity when you have the semi-solid range, you can have some 10 times more, even 20 or more in rayo casting, uh, depending of course on the, on the solid fraction. Do you think it could be useful or it could be a mess because there are particles that are sticking. There are <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's just, just an idea. Uh, yeah, I know. And uh, I, I I can only respond uh, in theory. Okay, yeah, I cannot yeah, for sure. say for sure. Um, but I'm going to uh, share again. Uh, I'm going to go back to the original equation that year that I showed, uh, the Bernoulli equation. And I think in principle one would be adding this term in the model because the absurd, exerted pressure would be on this end would be higher than the exit pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and so one would, because you'd have to get the material to force it out of an orifice. Um, so if you have no wetting, uh, you can probably do that only. But if there is wetting at the orifice, then one would have to add some additional modeling terms which we're currently working on. So it would be a more complicated setup uh, because you'd have to pressurize the top and, uh, not, the, and, and not the bottom. Uh, and uh, it would be also a more complicated model. But I, I think in theory, it should be feasible to do, mm -hmm. but it would take uh, a good, piece of research to yeah for sure, for sure. No, nothing nothing is for free in experimental yeah. work nothing that would be especially good new, new technologies and then uh, um another question is that will you really explore steels because steels uh, uh, yes. this area of our course is mainly related to steel properties steel so i a sort of uh, initiative for the whole 20 and 22 year, which is called steel for stu for future. And actually it would be fantastic because steel processing is complicated. Of course, you have continuous casting. Of course, there is also the development of new steels, uh, so-called lightweight steels, so very highly alloyed, especially with aluminum. <laughs> so again, it's a trap. And I think even knowing about the density, which is, is yeah. in the liquid state would not be uh, so so easy. So, so they are much more alloyed than one weight percent of aluminum, and so you, you go into the, the, the full aluminum mag manganese, typically, uh, steels, and which is a topic which is very interesting because uh, uh, we, one needs to go to lightweighting of steels, and on the other hand, there are very big troubles in casting them because it, it's ne nearly impossible to go into continuous casting as far as you know you yes. just go ingot casting and that. so i think it is a really technological hot topic about it and then but if i would i would like to have some other guys uh, making questions or thomas saying more observation because he is also professional in the field not like me the the other point is that uh, the algorithms for are uh, uh, for solving your your uh, your data that you are collecting are basically non-linear uh, uh, would say yes. questions that that you should solve numerically. Is there any prog progress, or if you are still using the same uh, uh, algorithms that you were using in the past? Because this no, is we, fantastic. We've, you can yeah. Please. We've been improving the algorithm considerably. Uh, to, to because that's one of the areas where we're trying to uh, increase the uh, or decrease the level of uncertainty and to do that you, you've got to look at different algorithms 
uh, to be able to improve the accuracy of predictions and the level of uncertainty. But I also wanted to go back to your comment about steel. Um, oh, and I'm going to go back and just show you this slide again. Uh, this unit that we built, we built it with the intention of going up to 16, 1700 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Uh, so this induction coil is powered by a 20 kilowatt induction furnace. Yeah, yeah. So Great. our intent is to go that high in temperature and to be able to uh, uh, be able to look at steels or uh, or um, super alloys for that, yeah, for for sure, that matter. For sure. For now, sure. since we have such a wonderful international audience here, let me let me be shameless and plug uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, NCERC, our funding agency in Canada, mm -hmm. has started a new program mm -hmm. called the Alliance International. Mm -hmm. And the Alliance International is one where it enables us in Canada to collaborate and get funding to collaborate mm -hmm. in research with colleagues abroad. Mm -hmm. But the way it works is uh, our colleagues abroad, when they write a proposal, if they would like to collaborate with us, mm -hmm. they would include us in the proposal that they write in their home country yeah. or in Europe or in Congo, sure. right? For sure. They would include us. Mm -hmm. And once your proposal is reviewed mm -hmm. and approved, Mm -hmm. We need to submit within three months a proposal mm -hmm. to NSERC asking for funds mm -hmm. so that we can do the work in collaboration that's been yeah. pro promised in our collaborators' proposal. Yeah. <laughs> and by doing that, we're able to get some funds over a three-year mm -hmm. period yeah. mm -hmm. to do the work in collaboration. And that means our graduate students can be mm -hmm. able to fly back and yeah. forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we can exchange materials, we can yep. exchange data, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So we're more than delighted to ex engage yeah. in these collaborations. We're allowed one of these proposals per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, we're we're happy to, to collaborate and to extend this technique and to share it with other people. For sure, for sure. As for me, I would be personally happy, but I think uh, there will be also other possibilities because we are really from some different parts of the world. So I will spread the word and possibly who is fit better than you it will join. But as for me, I would be happy to do that because I'm really interested, you know, especially, you know, we were thinking about with those colleagues in Brazil, but also for myself yeah. and for my past work, which was for a, for a period of my life on copper alloys, but now, uh, uh, I think uh, maybe aluminum would be very good. Maybe steel would be very good. So anything, and of course, I am in a, in a research institution, and I would be pleased to. So it's a good. Uh, it's good that you have said it explicitly, and I'm also explicitly available for any possible process and uh, of going on. Uh, but any anyone in other parts of the world is also. I think Hani is very uh, open-minded, and uh, I think Absolutely. you have a lot of. Yeah. Uh, of uh, work to do and, and to find even some other guys, some young guys to do like uh, Thomas has done in the in the past to, to do some experimental work, which is always nice if you have the right devices and in the, the, the new the new technique like it is this one. So uh, I wish you uh, uh, more and more success with this technique because I believe it is very, very competitive. I, I have been uh, starting again to try to have some information about, uh, I would say, viscosimeters, and they are so expensive, the, 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 the industrial viscosimeters. That, that's, that's your way is much better because it saves time and, and it is consistent. So when, when there is something that which is not working, you can check it and, and think again like you are doing. And yeah. I think it is, it is now, the, the right uh, the right way, to totally. It is the I, new I, thing. I, you're, you're right, Fabio. And, and maybe we should hear from uh, Tomac because Tomac uh, went through the process of using different techniques to measure, to make measurements. And he used the same alloys on the discharge crucible. I know this go back many years. Mm -hmm. And he used the discharge crucible to make the same measurements. And so he can compare the, tell us the level of effort mm -hmm. that it's taken him many years ago to do and collect all these three properties using different techniques versus getting it from the discharge crucible. Do you want to share with us, Tomac, your experience? Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, I had a lot of time spent with the digital crucible method. So I uh, maybe I, I back to the to to the question of semi solid, uh, Fabio. I think the the better um, technique for the measure of viscosity is this is the rotation method. So yeah. met mm -hmm. rotation yeah. the, the the crucible or. I think, yes, yeah. Pro probably you have some uh, some visco some some of your colleagues have it in in uh, in um, in Krakow because they have very very a very nice institute there. They are working very seriously. They are very serious guys, and, and so. But I, I I don't have it, so so I I'm looking for this one. But I think the approach by Honey is is fantastic because uh, I, I've been erratically working on the physical properties of liquid metals, and I think having all measuring at once it's fantastic and and i wish you a very uh, good success in the field for instance of steels highly a lot of steels and so on which for process parameters for simulation of for casting simulation there are uh, inputs that you really need i mean uh, something that uh, so please to be in contact with everyone and please to meet you again thomas has been visiting me uh, some summers ago because we have some seaside so we combine a visit both scientifically, we made a summer school, but he had also the possibility to go to the to our uh, sea, and uh, I hope uh, we will be back uh, meeting one another soon. And uh, I I think it's it's very nice uh, to go on in your direction, Henny. Of course, maybe Thomas, for other reasons that I have told you, maybe I will visit you sooner sure. than, than than you believe because I must pick up these guys unfortunately from Ukraine and if they they will reach you uh, or or they reach you uh, Poland I will pick them up by my car because they need to be uh, moved from from this terribly situation uh, to safer uh, situations so uh, I don't want to speak too much please Thomas why why don't don't you show yourself and and I will disappear from uh, the screen and then if you have the possibility to switch shot if, if you are if you are uh, without uh, troubles or <laughs> otherwise it's okay in, a, in any case but it, it, I'm happy that uh, you, you have joined us really and I'm happy that Henny has uh, has also this that possibility so Henny will you have the possibility also to 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 host some uh, some people, yes, for doing some experimental work. I think so. Or we can manage some taste, taste or what else in your own, uh, in your own, uh, I think so. We, yeah, we no, people, people are more than welcome to come and visit us and, yeah. and, and uh, share and we can formulate collaborations. But I want to yeah. hear Tomac's uh, comments first. Me, me too, me too. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Tomac. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I compare, you know, the, the, um, the methods, uh, Especially from the surface tension, there is well, the the trick was uh, with the uh, the hole of the crucible. Uh, when I talked with the uh, master student of the honey, uh, he have uh, a lot problem with the uh, obtained uh, the good results from the aluminum. Uh, so yeah. I I try to explain him uh, how to start to calibrate etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But then uh, when I realized he used the the alumina uh, crucible yes that i realized okay you have the problem with the wetting so yes. uh, yeah so uh, then i talk with the the, the i use the the angle 45 uh, uh, degree so uh, uh, in my opinion uh, this is when i prepare this crucible for many many uh, and during this um, calibration and and trying to to, to get the, the best results at uh, Without any working, uh, especially when I use only the the graphite crucible, in my yeah. experience. So uh, then I realize that I don't have the wetting. I don't have this problem, yeah. as he has. Yeah. So we are just talking about, and he had tried to uh, check the different angles uh, as uh, the honey show in this presentation. This is yeah. The, the problem was with the wetting uh, by the uh, aluminum uh, aluminum crucible, uh, but the uh, the honey also showed the the the, the compared two methods. This is the um, the diesel crucible method and the capillary method. The capillary method that was the um, we have built some equipment for the, the this uh, uh, experiment. And the, the viscosity, I think this is the, the best uh, method for the viscosity. 
uh, but the the, um, uh, the the crucible was the um, from the quartz so uh, and the problem was uh, for the different materials we can't use this uh, crucible with this uh, capillary because we have the problem with the temperature and uh, also with the um, um, uh, the start uh, the um, the materials uh, which we uh, study uh, start uh, um, doing some films on these crucibles and we don't uh, get the good result for but for the tin and, and, and silver that was the, the very good equipment and I have the, a lot uh, experiment with the alumina I spent alumina magnesium alloys uh, we have the publish I think the few years ago this paper but I spent uh, maybe two years to calculate and get the um, properly uh, value of the surface tension. That was the very uh, challenge to to, um, mm -hmm. to try to fit together the the two uh, um, yeah to get the the three free value of the density and viscosity and surface tension uh, properly. Um, regarding to the, the possibility to, to uh, doing some experiment with the honey in Alberta, finally they, they built the, the, the tower. Uh, this is the uh, finally um, the, the, the place of this tower or you plan to move another time, honey? The, the tower that you used to use for your experiments, we now use exclusively for atomization. Uh, we built this new system, which we call our thermal prop unit. It's a, it's, we've, we've basically invested a lot of money into building this unit that will be just exclusively used for a discharge crucible. Well, perfect. So I think that this is the, this method is very um, potential from the steel. This is the high temperature. I don't uh, in Krakow. I bought some equipment, but the, this is the equipment to. Mm -hmm. 800, maybe that. Uh, this is the maximum of the temperature when, when I can uh, use this equipment. But the from the steel, I think this is the, the very good uh, method to measure the viscosity, surface tension, and density. Yes, and if I may add, um, any and uh, Thomas as well, I have some friends and some colleagues in France in uh, this uh, Jean Lemour uh, Institute uh, in Nancy and also some uh, friends and colleagues uh, in the steel uh, R&D uh, department of a company which is based uh, here in Italy, which are from ACM, which is in Metz, uh, which is uh, not so far from Nancy. And there are some 20 guys devoted to R&D on steels of an Italian company. So I think we should try to do something together, even in steels, uh, because it, it's uh, fantastic to have some uh, di this device. And I think uh, especially for developing new steels, which have properties that uh, you, you cannot use uh, the software, if you don't have the physical properties, is, no, is nonsense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's How, which properties is you? Yeah, you the, the properties of pure uh, iron. Well, <laughs> it's yeah. another story. <laughs> If you so, so I think it's uh, it's something to to explore. And so, if if uh, possible, I will try to to lay down some proposals that uh, can be then uh, reproposed in, in your line, so so that we can sure. do and interact together. Because there is so many things to learn and so many things to, in this specific field, field uh, that I don't think it is uh, some sort of competition because it, there is all the. No. the <laughs> the, the, yeah. So many technical alloys, so many elements that you can do experiments. It's, it's something, but it is a very new, exciting field in my mind. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, any other observations from people uh, from other parts of the world? I would be happy uh, to have, if possible. Uh, I think, uh, for instance, Luca Milani, I don't think he's now here, but he's from Vesuvius. Vesuvius is a company which is manufacturing, uh, is from Vesuvius, Italy. I don't know. I, I've, I've seen that uh, maybe he's not here. Uh, and, uh, and so there are some other guys from, R chiefly from R&D. Uh, Nicoletta Bruno is from R&D company of Danieli, which is a very important company in steel making plant. And, uh, and so there are 
some other guys as well. But as for me, I'm perfectly uh, interested in, in, in developing uh, uh, new things. Uh, and if you're already at a good uh, new starting point, uh, yep. uh, it's fantastic. OK, so Great. we will keep in contact by email, honey, or, or all of you. And, and you, Thomas, maybe I will visit you quite soon uh, if these guys uh, they try yeah, sure. to try try the, the, to find their way from Ukraine to anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> we reach them in uh, Poland or in Hungary or in uh, Romania or what else because I want try really to 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 help them for a period, which is important yeah. as well. We are also in the Krakow. We have uh, some uh, program uh, also from the uh, research people from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, my head of the director, uh, she go uh, to take from the border, the one of the one, mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. guy, uh, the Yuri Plevachuk, uh, he mm -hmm. currently is in the Bratislava with the family, but uh, mm -hmm. he back to the Lvov, he mm -hmm. will be defended the, the city. So he decide to defend. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mamma mia, uh, we say in Italian, it's, it's yeah. something that, uh, uh, it is unbelievable uh, to be in such a situation, of course, uh, yeah. uh, full support. And we, we, of course, we, we all hope that we'll, they will stop uh, combating. And, and it's nonsense. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've been spending just one month, but uh, where there was Gorbachev my, for my thesis uh, many, many years ago. And so it was in, in Moscow. But uh, and then I was flying from Ukraine to that was Kiev to, to Moscow. It is crazy. This is very, very crazy situation. Hope it will stop because for our in Euro, for our, our Europe, it is something dangerous and very worrying. And for, for the people involved, it's, the, it's really a risk of their life. So, oh, so yeah, mm. yeah. So, honey, happy to 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 see you in a way again. Yes, and, and this is, this is the, 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 the useful me. part of the of the pandemics that we can use uh, the, these remote talks without troubles. Before we didn't, but yes. now we we have started, and we will have. I will be pleased if you have any possible uh, further meeting. I, I would be because uh, we will keep all the year long uh, activities. So, if you have some connection that you can promote your own approach, uh, university and devices. I, I'm really pleased to do it. OK, thank you. Thank, thank you. you really. Keep me on your list. It. I'd love to hear other other people's talks and other people's work. Yeah, I'd love I will to hear what people are doing. Yeah, OK, I will inform participate you. in future as an audience member in future uh, yeah. seminars. This okay. is great. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you, Thomas. My special regards and uh, best regards to all of you around the world. <laughs> OK, thank Bye. you again. Bye. Hey, Bye. Honey, Bye. Could you wait for? Sure, I can. Could you stay there? Yeah. Yeah, I can wait. I can wait, Tomac. OK. I